Welcome to another episode of Just One More Fix. This is James. With me in this episode is Lacey. Hey. You can find us online at justonemorefix.com or on Twitter at Just One More Fix. If you like us, you can support us at Patreon and you can give us a rating and review at iTunes or wherever you find us at. In this episode, we're going to sit down with James Edder Reggie IV and Jonathan Tweet. Hey. And now, it's time to get our gaming fix. Hi, I'm Stargate Pioneer. And I'm Steven Jondrew, and we're from Better Podcasting, a proud member of the Gunna Geek Network. Just like the show you're listening to now. The opinions expressed are those of the individual host. Check out all the other podcasts at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. And get ready, because geekiness begins in three, two, one. You're about to listen to our interview with... James Raggi and Jonathan Tweet. We sat down with them after Gen Con. You may notice that the audio in this one is a little bit off from what we would normally release, but that's because we recorded this outside. So you're going to hear some road noise and some crickets and some cicadas. Maybe it'll provide a little bit of ambiance. And without any further ado, here is James Raggi and Jonathan Tweet. So this weird thing happened today. It was a complete accident and it didn't strike me as odd until just after it happened. So Sundays at Gen Con are usually much slower than the other days. So last night I, I put out a call on Twitter. If you've got a good pitch, come down to the Lamentations booth and give it to me and maybe we can make a deal for a book. So this guy comes down and he has this amazing pitch. He's like, yeah, you know, he has this idea. And then I say, well, what if you did this? And he was like, yeah, and what about this? I was like, yeah, it's like, let's do this. So I take him behind the table, you know, the back of the booth. And I, I go into my backpack and, you know, I give him a, you know, a wad of cash, $1,000, put it in his hand. You know, this is the advance for the project. And it's like, let me get the paperwork and we could sign this. And I take out the paperwork, turn to him. It's like, okay, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, and then it's just it's like, wham, upside the head. It's like, oh, wait, I, I do things oddly, don't I? <laughs> Uh, surely this isn't the industry standard. <laughs> well, I, even if it's not, though, it's been a very clear path to success. So yeah. for better or worse, I suppose, you know, um, I'd keep doing it, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I think you've given um, a larger voice to a lot of smaller creators that probably wouldn't have been published otherwise and have had have led on to uh, large, great success in the in the role-playing industry. So it's mm -hmm. very awesome. I saw your tweet that you put out said, if you had an idea, come by and pitch it to me and whatever. Mm -hmm. And there's no one else doing that. And I think that is one of the things that attracts people to Lamentations and makes you guys, like, you know, Lamentations uniquely its own thing. And um, I actually saw that and, like, kind of jotted it down as a note. And I was like, that's awesome because there are so many creative voices out there and everybody has their... I think it's Stephen King says everybody has at least one story to tell. Yeah. And so even if you've only got one, you know. I don't think that's true because very recently online, you know, I've I've now released eight separate new products this year, including mm -hmm. the Creature Generator New Edition. I mean, that was like completely redone. So that counts. So, And I wanted to do ten things this year. And I wasn't sure if any of the projects in the works were going to make it before the end of the year. So I just put out pitches. I wanted short projects, something that we could turn around and definitely get at least two out of. So I did an open call, got over 100 entries, and I'm no longer convinced that every gamer has one good role-playing <laughs> supplement in them. <laughs> uh, Might be buried very deep. Yeah, but the one thing I'm scared of is, is I have this roster of people that I use over and over, you know, Zach keeps doing stuff for me. Zarkov keeps doing stuff for me. And I'm just worried about Lamentations becoming closed, becoming like this right. closed group and just having, you know, this certain way of doing things. And so I like to reach out and try to get, you know, new people and new ideas and things that mm -hmm. make me go, wait, really? Uh, because it's, it, it's right at that point of not being sure whether I should be doing this that that's what I need to be doing. Right. Because Zach, you know, for example, Zach turns in a project and, you know, some certain things I, I, yeah, I, we have to go back and forth on tweaking. But in general, he knows what I want to do and he'll go to other publishers with other things. Right. And, you know, I'm good with most of what Zach does. It's a very easy transaction in that mm -hmm. way. But I want things that aren't easy, that aren't that. So... Mm -hmm. 
because theoretically, I mean, I know how it is. Somebody that likes my stuff, if they like some of it, they're going to want most of it or all of it. And But I like the idea of having a product line that's all for the same game, but some people like some of the stuff mm-hmm. and hate some of the stuff, and it, it's a variety. It's... I don't want to say something for everybody, but there, there's something for a wide variety of people to, to pick and choose from. That, that's what I hope for. And, you know, I was just some idiot just starting to make stuff, making Death Frost Doom. And then like, oh, somebody likes this. And, right. and the things that, that, that I've been able to do and the access I now have to the market to use, you know, that kind of talk... It, it shouldn't be that difficult for the next person with a good idea to to have an audience. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if I can find something that I can bring to the audience and, you know, help them be a little bit of a success, you know, because whatever success they have, I have, mm-hmm. because generally I do 50-50 profit sharing deals. So Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's kind of like famine thinking to think that uh, I've got to suck up everything and there's not room for everyone in the in the in that creative role-playing space, no matter yeah. what kind of game you're playing. And I think that sort of I, um, is one of the things that holds a lot of people back, uh, be, like other um, publishers and that kind of stuff in the industry, because they're sort of afraid to reach out and, and give uh, artists and writers and creators their own legs to say, make your thing and not take their voice away from them so there's still their own personality in it. Yeah, well, the the stuff that just came out for Gen Con, I mean, there were, uh, I, I'm worried, because uh, I don't know if there was some Gen Con person with a, the clipboard going, okay, not him again, you know, <laughs> because those things that were specifically made to debut at Gen Con, I, you, you know, I asked someone, it's like, hey, you want to do a project? Yeah, what do you want it to be about? How about a menstruation demon? I was like... Oh, oh, that'll go over well at Gen Con. Okay, it's like, well, what, what do you want to do for the cover? How about the women's a woman's legs with like the blood running down? It's like, okay, that'll go over. Okay, let's do that. And it's like, yeah, yeah. And I want a woman doing the illustrations. That that's fine. You know, let's give the text a layout. And there, oh, oh, she's naked and playing with her. Oh God. Okay, <laughs> let's do that. I hope nobody opens the book at the convention. And then Jeff Rince's thing with the, the Obscene Serpent Religion 2, you know, Yannick Bouchard makes this awesome picture, mm-hmm. but it's got an exposed nipple. It's like, oh, God, I'm going to have that on the table. And, but I'm not telling these people no. I right. won't tell these people no when they have an idea, and I recognize it's a good idea, but I'm scared about the market. So About, about people pushing back against that, against, against you and Lamentations? Yeah, uh, it's... it's it's a creative medium, and in every other entertainment medium, you, you can have the, the family-friendly mass market stuff mm-hmm. and then the weirder niche products, and they all work very well together. Right. The, the best story I have about that is a movie theater. I went to a movie festival, and they showed a Serbian film, mm-hmm. which is the nastiest, sure. roughest, yeah. holy crap. And then a couple months later, in that same room, they're showing The Avengers. <laughs> you know, you know, this was, right. You know, back a few years ago, and you go to a bookstore in the, in the horror section. You've got mm-hmm. Goosebumps and early Clive Barker on the, in the same shelf space, and I'm going to fight for that in role playing as well because my tastes are for that weirder horror metal stuff. Right. And you know, if the people don't like it, then I won't be able to hang. But if the people like it, you know, someone telling me I can't do it can piss off because. I'm, I've got the sales, I'm mm-hmm. making the money, and I'm winning the awards. It's like, what more do I have to do to get people to say, oh, okay, that, that's an actual thing that people right. can do. Well, that's, without prob- you. that's probably what makes people angry is that you're winning those awards and making <laughs> that money. <laughs> have you gotten any specific pushback from the people that actually run the convention? No. Um, but again, I don't know if they would go to you directly and say, <clears throat> that that's not good. Or if it's just some checklist they make in the decision to let me come back. I, I, I don't know how that works, but nobody has come up to me and says, this isn't cool. So why do you think that there's like this sort of disconnect with people about how it's okay and they don't have a problem going into a bookstore to buy those kind of books or whatever where they're okay to have them on the same shelf or in a movie theater? And they no one complains about that, but they do with like RPGs. Is there something that you've thought of that like why it's different? 
Uh, there's a couple things. Uh, one of them I think will be easy to talk about, and the other one is a bunch of landmines. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> First one, I think there's a lot of uh, latent, uh, I don't know, um, latent attitudes from the satanic panic right. days. Like we, we don't want to attract any attention by being that bad thing. But and I don't think I, that's the case anymore, though, because it's gotten so big, like – it's mainstream now. D and D and role playing. It's on The Simpsons. I, somebody mentioned the other, or at, at the Ennies yesterday, or, or right. a couple days ago, I guess now. But, but there's some fear that again isn't in any other medium. That if someone comes across like Lamentations, right. and sees that, they'll decide all role playing games are like that and just disregard the hobby forever, which doesn't make sense to me. But it just it seems the attitude never went away. I mean, the people that were big into role playing then are still around, and they they're still worried that oh my god, we don't need any bad publicity. That everything needs to be safe. Whereas when I was a kid, I was very annoyed. As a kid, you don't know much about anything, right? <laughs> but I was deep into D and D. And then when we have a police officer come to our school to warn us about the evils of heavy metal and role-playing games, <laughs> I wasn't into metal at the time, right. but I knew that they were just full of crap about the role-playing. Yeah. And that's really the kind of thing that, that formed this distrust of authority and wanting to just poke around and ask questions about the things mm -hmm. you're not supposed to ask questions about. So I, I don't fit in anywhere because whatever the established order is, I, I'm like, poke? Is that is that the way it should be? Poke? Can we do this? Poke? And, and, and everybody loves you for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so these days I don't – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the two most divisive words – in America right now, but like political correctness. Right. You know, people are worried. It's like, is this racist? Is this cultural appropriation? Is this sexist? And, it, you know, if I want to show somebody's guts hanging out, I'll show someone's guts hanging out. If I want to do like a 70s fantasy style artwork with, you know, here, there are all the curves and there's that, you know, I'll, I'll do that. And it's fine. It, it's really fine. You know, and, and yeah, I mean, it, it's all taste. I mean, what, how you think that your make-believe character should be dressed is a matter of taste, just like how I think my make-believe character right. should be dressed. And I've got a variety of stuff, but people will, people will ignore the stuff that they would applaud if other publishers did it. You know, it doesn't count that I do it because I have that other stuff, and that erases everything. And I, I think that is a problem. And I, I, I've worked with people that have uh, worked with larger publishers, and they love that they can just pitch an idea to me. And I'll say, yeah, let's go with mm -hmm. it. And what they submit, you know, if there are changes, I work with them on the changes. They, they don't get the book in their hands and go, what did you do to my work? Right. And, and I, I, I get the feeling then that the uh, larger publishers, they there's a line they want to tow, which is fine. But do I don't understand how such big companies can all – can, can – want to have this wide variety of products all have the same feeling. It, is that it's just very because weird. you think they want to hit the mass market and sell as many units as they can as opposed to uh, gearing towards a specific audience and giving them what they actually want? Yeah, but, they, but they're also big enough. I mean, they could also provide the alternative, you uh, know? Well, so I worked yeah. at Wizards for 15 yeah. years. Okay. Um, and so I've got a little bit of insight into what the man wants. And... Um, <laughs> the man. <laughs> and, 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 you know, honestly, if you have a, a property that's making you tons and tons of money, from a corporate perspective, what you want is uh, brand consistency. Yeah. Right? You you want to have a brand uh, proposition, and you want everything you produce to support that brand proposition, and it's just business sense. And, um, you know, there were there were people when we were talking about third edition who said, well, every every designer should do their own thing, and then... People would follow this designer or that designer, but no corporation wants a big line where half the people are following one guy and half the people are following right. another writer and, and yeah. all their products sell at half the rate. And so instead, all the voice has to be, you know, nominalized and equalized so that somebody else can step in, a freelancer can step in and write something that supports the brand proposition. And anything edgy or, uh, you know, that, that's ambiguous or that takes work to interpret it's really hard for that to satisfy a brand proposition. Everything that's clear, like you're fighting kobolds. Okay, that fits the brand proposition. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's a natural result of having a brand that you 
that you want to protect and maximize. And and if you're if you're a Hasbro shareholder or whatever, how much do you care about the artistry of role playing games? True. That's fair. Yeah. But why why not go the route that White Wolf did in the two thousands with Black Dog? You know, was it Black Dog Press? I think it was. Yeah, and they yeah. like they had a more adult line and say not even just wizards, but other any any you know per, uh, publisher say this is our sort of. Uh, PG-13 material, and this is our R-rated material. And like you said, in the movie theaters, no one seems to care. So why is it not okay to do that when no one has a problem going and watching some action movie where people are being shot to pieces and there's not even a, a, a peep about it anywhere? So the movie thing is a really different... Uh, it's a whole different way uh, for it, someone to interact with the medium. So, like, imagine that you went to... Avengers movies, and one Avengers movies was sort of a goofy rom-com, and then you went to the next Avengers movie, and it was sort of some horrific, bloody, uh, w- w- what have you. If it was, isn't that what they just did though with following up Infinity War with Ant Man and the Wasp? That's it's sort of, thinking. I mean, yeah, not not, I mean, Infinity War wasn't bloody, but I mean, that what, holy it was crap, was not uplifting. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that, that was a brutal, and violent Ant-Man movie. Is the rom com of Marvel movies. Yeah, I yeah, mean. it was like a Disney ad- kids adventure mm-hmm. almost, like an intentional palate cleanser. And yeah. I, well, I actually so, kind of like that too. That they, they're that when you go see them, I know when I go see Ant Man. It's going to be goofy, and they don't take it too seriously, and Thomas the Train Engine is going to go wrecking mm. off of something, and you're going to laugh. And at the same time, when you see Avengers, I like the darkness of it and the, the tragedy yeah. of it. Yeah. Well, so if you look at a big brand like Dungeons & Dragons, it's more like Avengers than Marvel. Yeah, uh, right. That's, right? Yeah. that's and, true. And yeah. so you fall in love with the Avengers characters, and you expect a certain thing out of an Avengers movie. Um, and, uh, and what White Wolf was able to do, even their... You know, their mainstream stuff was already edgy. They had yeah, people in true. lingerie yeah. and people drinking blood and all, all that kind of stuff. So it helped them to have their, you know, was it Black Dog, the mm-hmm. the uh, yeah. scary adult stuff. Right. That, that totally fit their uh, their brand proposition is that they're the more mature, more mm-hmm. adult uh, provider of role-playing games. It's not necessarily a fair comparison between the two because it's two totally different kind of genres. Yeah. And, appeals of fan base but it's yeah but but even so like in the 90s the game of thrones the the books yeah you know that those were pretty popular right. back then you know for for the fantasy literature and it doesn't seem that D decided hey let's let's dip into that mm-hmm. when they could have but and it's hard to argue with the success of game of thrones game of i mean thrones, it's everywhere yeah. now and it's brought a lot of people into the fantasy yeah, sort of space that wouldn't probably normally be there. It tricked them. <laughs> yeah. So, so I get. I mean, I I don't know why I'm complaining too much because the fact that the the big companies really don't do this gives me a space. Right. <laughs> yeah. I but it. I guess. I mean, now that's good for me because I have a thing. But back when I was just starting, I was just mad that that there was really no option for the kind of stuff I liked. I couldn't just go buy it. I had to make it. Right. And then, <laughs> I was like, my God, you know, what a pain in the ass it is to start a role-playing company and make it a success because nobody else could have bothered doing this stuff. So, obviously, role-playing is a kind of a small industry. Do you think that there's room in the industry for another, not exactly like Lamentations, but another small uh, uh, publication that is going to push boundaries, maybe in different ways, that there's enough room in the in the I, the market or however, you know, you want to say that for people to be successful that way? Absolutely. I mean, Dungeon Crawl Classics, you know, they, they don't go in for the aesthetic I do exactly, but it's still a grimy kind of retro, rough 70s kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you got the Pathfinder, you got D&D 5th Edition, Vampire is going to be a, a big player again, and I don't think that any of these other companies are going to experience some shortfall of fans because right. of it. So I, I think there's there's plenty of room, you know, like the Star Trek stuff doesn't seem to be taking away from anyone, but yeah. it's got its own success. Yeah, I, I don't think there's an upper limit of, of different things that can be successful here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so so many people play so many different games. I know at our table we, we're all over the place, and it's sort of why I like it. No one wants to watch Lord of the Rings only every time you come to a TV screen, right? Yeah. So... Well, when you mentioned uh, taking submissions at the booth and Lamentations having its own sort of style and voice, what are the th- things that sort of when you someone makes a pitch to you and you think this is 
this is the next thing that I'm going to try and push. Are there specific things that you look for or I, I know they're like, cause you're, it's so broad. It's more things that I'm not looking for. Like, uh, if it's an adventure they're pitching, if like the end goal of how you finish the adventure is part of the pitch, I'm just imagining that it's going to be way too, it, it, it's a closed ended thing. Mm-hmm. It's, it should be more open ended. That should have the players deciding how they engage and what their own goal is. Uh, so, uh, and I like to do stuff that's set in historical, you know, 17th century earth or something that at least doesn't interfere with it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like Lovecraft. You know, he said his stories on Earth, but there was stuff happening in the in the margins. Yeah, like I just yeah, I just published you know sounds for the Mushroom Kingdom, where there's like mushroom men in the in the Earth and stuff's coming up. That could exist. We don't know what's under yeah, the Earth yeah, right, right now. You know, so maybe this stuff happened and the villagers you know stopped it. It just never made history. It could have happened. You know, it, it's but what people will want to do when they hear historical is they'll want to they'll want to go Doctor Who on it. Mm-hmm. The one thing I hate about Doctor Who is that every single thing that's ever happened in history is aliens now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I so I like having, you know, if you're work in history, but leave the history alone. Mm-hmm. The history that we understand actually happened as we understand it. The magic stuff was happening later. Or, uh, or like the God that crawls. I, I turned St. Augustine mm-hmm. into this big bleh, mass, but that was after the history we understand. Mm-hmm. So it didn't change that. So anything that that wants to use history and turn it supernatural, I hate. Or people who use too much folklore, because I think one of the things about weird fantasy is you're not using vampires and you're right. not using werewolves. It's not off the shelf. Yeah. Yeah. Y- yeah, and... And especially with the 17th century, everybody wants to do a witch thing. Right. And we've done we've done a couple of witch things, but I've also done a couple of things where the the adventure area is enclosed in an impenetrable force field. It's like right. we're done with force fields. We're done with witches. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a really interesting example when you did um, Better Than Any Man. Yeah. And there's a, a bunch of weird. Su- Weird magic stuff going on, but also Gustavus Adolphus and his army is invading. Yeah. Right? And that's also really terrible and totally a historical event. Right. Yeah, well, and there were witch hunts happening there, but there were it was it was like real life. The ones that they're hanging aren't the real witches. Right? <laughs> and the real witches are over here doing this other stuff. Well, I, it's as you mentioned, vampires and that kind of stuff being off the shelf. It's one of the things when I read in the uh, creature generator is that the in weird fantasy that the creature should be the set piece in sort of like a creature feature style movie. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's a hundred percent true. And it sort of makes the impact of it so much more when everything seems mundane on the surface. And then all of a sudden, pow, here it comes and it hits you instead of just running through 200 yeah. kobolds. And yeah. I mean, we've all done that. And to be honest, I don't want to buy that adventure because I could probably manage that on my own. You know? Well, and, and it, and like D and D in Pathfinder it gets their monster manuals, and they become so standardized that the players know all this yes. stuff. And and uh, why wouldn't they? Mm-hmm. And it's stupid to have players pretend to not know mm-hmm, something they right. know. Oh no, there's a troll. Oh, water doesn't hurt it. Oh, not silver. Oh, oh well, let's try fire fourth so it won't seem like we're <laughs> cheating you know that's stupid but at the same time oh it's a troll okay firebomb it that's that's no good either right and when you meet a monster <laughs> you're you're meeting you, you know you're encountering this supernatural inhuman thing right charge just doesn't it, that why you know that's not atmospheric and that's mm-hmm. not yeah it I, rem- yeah. reminds me sort of of Star Trek where you would often they'd be visiting sort of a civilized place or an outpost or whatever, and there would be some weird monster secretly stalking around the Horda that was killing yeah. the miners or whatever, or the the shape-shifting creature that ate salt and what have you. But but it's, it's like weird fantasy in that there's some cr- creepy monster that nobody knows what it is, and part of the fun is finding out. Right. So yeah. the investigation and the discovery, it actually adds to the game as opposed to being, like you said, Oh, it's the Cobalt. He has four hit points, and yep. we know that this yeah. is his. And their solution, or not there, I guess. The solution for a lot of uh, games seems to be uh, Monster Manual 2, 
Monster Manual yeah. Three, Greater Monster Cobalt, Manual Four, yeah, yeah, and, Water uh, Cobalt. I, I, yeah, I think a monster. It should be. It should be like a complication, almost like a trap, more than an encounter. Air quotes. You know, I'm doing here. Yeah. That, like, what 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 a lot of games set up as an encounter really sounds so pre-programmed like we know the players are going to do this where it should be open-ended here's this strange thing it'll have its own motivations maybe it's hostile maybe maybe the threat it poses is incidental to what it's actually doing because it's not of human stuff and so it's so it's hard to understand which sounds like some of the better star trek stuff anyway yeah and even if the thing you can do is you know just murder the crap out of it Maybe that's not the best thing to right. do. And I can think of Star Trek things, too. Well, we could just shoot it with the phasers, but that's not the right thing to do. Right. And it's really weird. I'm, th- <laughs> I'm wanting Lamentations characters to act like a Star Trek crew. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of my favorite things about some of, their adve- of, of the adventures from Lamentations is that most of them can be solved or you know uh, completed without combat being the first thing that you have to go to and in fact yeah, if you yeah. resort to combat that's often the worst outcome that you can yeah. end up with yeah yeah uh, i remember one review for the god that crawls it was a play test review so if i i'll just want to say uh, as an aside play test reviews of rule systems i think are good because just by reading the rules sometimes there are complications and interactions between rules bits that aren't obvious when you mm-hmm. read it that make sense absolutely but for adventures i don't think that actual play reviews are necessarily any good because then you're reviewing one possibility of what happens right. when with a good adventure there could be almost an infinite number mm-hmm. of things that could happen. Yeah. Oh, and there's so, so many things to change too because depending on who's running the game, their own storyteller voice, yeah. the characters yeah. at the table, the, their own personalities yeah. and whatever, yeah. it's, it is entirely useless, I agree. But uh, but for The God That Crawls, there was this actual play review. It was like a group of like five players or something and they first encounter The God That Crawls and they attack and it was a total party kill of course now this this god you know can only attack once per round right so just thinking of this situation let's say you're with a bunch of friends and you see (laughs) you see this big tough guy that you think ah let's go kick the crap out of them and you all attack now let's say this tough big one one tough guy Knocks out one of your friends, and there's still four of you. Ah, lucky right. shot. And then he punches another one of you. There's three <laughs> of you left. You think, ah. And then he punches out another one of you. There's just the two of you, and you think, yeah, this is a good thing to keep doing. <laughs> and then he punches out the, the second to last guy. So you're the last one. This guy has just kicked the crap out of four of your friends, and you're thinking, eh, I can still take him. <laughs> you know, at, at what point... You know, the complaint was there was nothing that signaled that the monster was this powerful, which, okay. Well, the god that crawls should have given them a clue in the title, I think. let's say that's true, that this was a complete screw job. How many characters have to die before (laughs) someone thinks, you know... Maybe maybe charging at this thing was the wrong thing to do. Maybe, you know, retreat, you know, get some new characters, have a new strategy of tackling this. No. Attack! Oh, what a crappy adventure. I mean, what the... Well, it's part of the premise is that the, in most OSR stuff is that it's, it's all about trying to um, put the pieces together to investigate and use your the knowledge you gain to sort of work your way through what's happening yeah, and yeah. not just say, there's the bad guy, let's go chop them to bits yeah so right on so you guys at the ennies this year uh osr games uh took home 11 any awards there were four silvers six golds and one judge's pick Mm -hmm. and clearly there's a demand for osr and it's growing and and moving forward do you see lamentations as an osr product or i mean an osr is such a loaded term it doesn't even really have its own identity anyway because no one seems to like be able to define what it is and i you know to be honest i don't even know either but well well, to me i would think my my impression of the term osr it's the group of games that that are all intercompatible they're all roughly old school D right right so if you take anything from one of them you can use it with any of the other ones but then i hear oh osr shouldn't just be D and it's like well okay so like this is a, okay i'm gonna mess up the name the zweihander game yeah just one uh, best game and best pro you know product of the year and that's a ret- basically a retro clone of old Warhammer, but that's not something that's intercompatible with mm-hmm. you know the old the, the other OSR stuff. So if you call that OSR, 
then what's the utility because you can't just mix and match between the two? I mean, right. it's obviously a quality product that people like, uh, but... It has a sort of different lineage. Yeah, but to call it, you know, to say it's not OSR isn't an insult. Mm -hmm. It's just the line saying that that's, it's not a useful term to indicate, you know, the intercompatibility. Uh, but the fact that OSR stuff does so well, uh, I think... I think there's a few reasons why we do well at the Ennies, whereas, say, the Origins Awards, we don't do so well. But it is like a, uh, you know, it's this groundswell. It's, it's a grassroots kind of movement. And I do think at this point, you know, it used to be, oh, this is just a niche of a niche of a niche. And, and now, no, we're, we're here. We are a solid block of the industry now. <laughs> Yeah, and that's exciting because I, I I wasn't one of the first people in the door, but well, it you know from this vantage point, I guess somebody just getting into it might think so. But I helped build this, mm -hmm. and I can have success, and there are other people having success. I, I don't know if I'd go so far as, as saying that like I'm the one that opened the door to all these people because there's a lot of things about the OSR I didn't invent. I just took advantage of right you know the thing that i'm hoping to open the doors for is if i take the heat for some of the weirder content maybe the next guy doesn't have right. to take the heat but be you one know, step behind lamentations is basically the sweet spot right yeah yeah uh, <laughs> so that that is something i'd love to be known for but the idea that i built an osr for other people to be successful in that's going too far well i also think that it's a demand for more interesting and inspired uh, adventures and and supplements and stuff because I know a lot of people that play exclusively 5e they they use other OSR products in their games because they sort yeah. of slide right in pr uh, pretty seamlessly really hmm. and that's whether you wanted it to use for Pathfinder or 3e or 5e yeah and I think that it's maybe as time goes by there might be a broader um, spectrum of products from some of the you know the larger publishers because they see you know, um, the almighty dollar yeah. sort of lowest common denominator in a lot of cases, right? And it's it's hard to argue with uh, with profits, obviously. So. Well, I, I do wonder uh, because I've got no doubt with Wizards Wizards of the Coast saying that D and D is selling better than it's ever sold. That they're obviously folding in all of the uh, all of the PDF and print on demand stuff through one bookshelf. All the older D right. the, those numbers are obviously getting folded into the greater company's <laughs> profits. I'd be very curious to know what percentage of of the money is that older stuff because I have I have the impression that that stuff is very successful and maybe it's just maybe it's just 10%, maybe it's 5% and on you know and, and on the scale of Wizards of the Coast that still looks really successful from where I am. But maybe it's a larger chunk than anyone's letting on. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I'd be very curious to know the truth about that. So this is our first time that we actually went to the Ennies. I always follow the Ennies, always look at the games that are yep. nominated and win. But for Publisher of the Year, Wizards of the Coast won. Hmm. And that's they're, hard, it's, they're successful, and that's great. But they didn't even show. Yeah. And I was like... It felt really crappy. Yeah, I was yeah. like, I realized you guys are huge, RGs. and that's great, and you're big, and that's awesome. But like... Like there wasn't an intern or something, somebody. <laughs> okay, now I, I'm I'm going to make a statement based on internet hearsay, so I want to give that disclaimer. But somebody says that they they um, that they were told by a representative of Wizards of the Coast that the reason they didn't enter anything into the Ennies is they wanted to give a chance for smaller publishers to get the spotlight. What a bunch of horseshit! Because I remember three years ago, Red and Pleasant Land beat right the play the fifth edition player's handbook mm -hmm. you know for uh what was that for best writing right. yeah we beat them in fan voting and everybody did well in comparison to starfinder and paizo's what definitely number two in the right. industry and they they didn't get much of anything that they were nominated for and so this so this whole thing of oh no we want to is is crap it's really crap i well even outside of that i just thought, we can beat them <laughs> my my thought was it's not even necessarily about beating them or yeah. saying we want to make space for other people but if this is the industry you're part of 
even if you don't want your stuff to win, shouldn't you show up and say, hey, we're here, we're part of this, we want to support other creators? At least and accept the award you've just won. I know, and I was just, you know, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of D&D, and I play loads of third, and I hear good stuff about five, but I thought that just seemed kind of, I mean, not to be all pretentious about it, but I was like, that's just really kind of a shitbag thing to do, to not yeah. even show up. Not even one person? Now, now the NEs have changed a lot of rules lately. For example, uh, publishers aren't allowed to campaign for specific judges. Right. I wish they just would have called that the new Lamentations rule. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but a good rule for them to do is that you cannot be entered as a... Uh, you, you cannot be nominated for fan favorite publisher if you don't submit anything to the NEs that right. year. I think that would be a reasonable rule. But I, I'm not trying to cause problems, I just, but I was like... I love pro what? I am a disruptor. There is so... <laughs> I know you are. Now that... You're right. Now, now but... that... Yeah, no, 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 no. Well, now he said, I'm doing a project with Jonathan Tweet coming up. I, I understand up. that. I understand yeah, that. I, I'm but, working with Ken Height now. I like sending out my tentacles into the established mm -hmm. industry. Well, Keelong was awesome. You yeah, because... You know, I don't want to talk out of turn. I don't know if this has to be cut out, but uh, Height uh, at the Ennies after party, Height was sitting around with a bunch of OSR guys, and someone asked Height, you know, what are you, what are you doing here around the OSO? Or, he's like, K Long, bitches, what am I getting cred checked at the kitty table now? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on. Yeah, but yeah, it's. Uh, the idea that we're somehow separate from the industry, or even though I'm trying to be disruptive, you know, I, I'm still a little guy. I'm one guy operating out of his apartment in Finland, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I'm competing successfully with with crews that have offices and employees. And but disruption is good. That's what that's what pushes things yeah, and yeah. makes things better and grow and more inspiration and yeah, yeah. But I and and I know there are talented people, and I and I was making offers to people this weekend, but I know. There are some people that are like, well, if I work with them, I'm I'm sort of like, you know, I, I've got the mark on me now. Right. So I, I'm glad yeah. that people like, yeah, well, you, well, it leads you credit, can tell credibility a story to it. About so that, you know, so I'm glad that some people are willing to, you know, cross the divide, so to speak, right, and, and, and to work with us because again, I'm trying to make everything different. It's not like oh, one of us, one of us. <laughs> It's like, well, like even Zach, you know, he he's the one that wins most of the awards that Lamentations wins. And he takes a lot of heat needlessly. Yeah, he I think. Well, he takes a lot of heat. But, you know, at the booth at Gen Con, while he's selling stuff at my table, he's promoting the Kickstarter that he's doing for another publisher. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the fact that he can do different things and, and people should be able to be free to come in and do something for me and then jump back out to their other stuff. I d it should not be a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is the project that, you know... Uh... So it hasn't been officially announced. Well, we announced it on the internet. Yeah. And then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere. There must be truth in it. It was on the internet, right? Yeah. So, so you can talk about yeah? this Yeah. Okay, so... Um... So he talked me into doing a 1630s version of uh, Aller Marja, which is the setting for my Over the Edge game, mm -hmm. which is... Um, Probably by the time people hear this, the Kickstarter will be over, mm -hmm. uh, but it's already well-funded and what have you. So that's a modern, uh, urban, free-form, surreal kind of setting. And um, I have been interested in doing some kind of weird fantasy for a while. Right on. And uh, didn't, didn't know really how to approach it or what system I would use exactly. And then uh, James contacted me. And um, it took me a little while to get my head around the idea, but now I'm... Totally sold. I've you know been playtesting it and what have you, and the the sixteen thirty setting is way cooler than I thought it would be. Right, and it is. He mentioned Lovecraft, um, mm -hmm. and it is sort of uh, sort of like Call of Cthulhu in that you're playing a historical figure, um, and you are in the in a historical period, but there's weird stuff going on under the surface, mm -hmm. and that's that's a great uh, template for. Uh, like a role playing campaign, role playing adventure. So, are there things in in this product that are going to connect? Because you said it's, it's the it's the over the edge right. setting earlier. Are there things in that that are going to connect to the 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 over the edge in the modern time? So, yes and no. Uh, so, I hate continuity. Uh, <laughs> right on. Right. I mean, continuity. Oh, come on. Continuity well, I, is. I like it so long as you don't feel like as you buy the product, it locks you in. It's your right. book. Do what you want with yeah, it. You know. Yeah. Well, but as a game designer, continuity is all the stuff I'm not allowed to do. 
Right. right? Like if I go right for a line and it's all about the continuity, I ha- like, well, I can't do this and I can't do that and it has to be this way. I, and, and that's that's oppressive. Right? If right. you want to do something really creative, it's hard to do that. You can do it, but it's mm-hmm. harder to do it if you're following somebody else's continuity or even your own continuity. So when I redid Over the Edge, it's still a modern day, just like the 1992 version, but I rewrote it. So the the same characters and places and conspiracies and aliens are there or whatever. But now I, I've just rewritten them sort of like I'm doing a re- reboot based on what I remember from my own game. Right. Because I didn't want to do a long time. Right. <laughs> I didn't want to do, hey, 25 years later, this is what they're doing now and their mm-hmm. kids are growing up or whatever, because that's boring. boring. Right. And so this is the same way. It is Alamarja in 1630, but it is not like literally on a chronology a or a continuity with what's going on in the present. Instead, it is, wow, if I were doing Alamarja in 1630 instead of a couple of years in the future, what would it look like? Mm-hmm. And so it has a lot of the, some of the same themes. Uh, it has got characters that are sort of echoes of the characters in the modern day or, or what have you. But uh, it's not it isn't derivative. And I'm I'm not worrying about how this is going to work and I'm not limiting myself oh I can't put that in because it's not part of the continuity from the right. the the Atlas game right? right so so yes and no it's like the fans of uh over the edge will see oh I see what he did with the hospital oh I see what he did with the temple of the divine experience because those are there but all mm-hmm. but in all new forms it's like it's a parallel universe where you know the things from one game are represented in another, but it's, there's no literal connection among them. So there's it's fun for the fans and the people who don't know the modern day setting. It's just all cool stuff. So is it still going to be have that surrealist feel to it? Even oh yeah, it's much <laughs> right on. <laughs> I mean, I I think it's part of the surreal feel in Over the Edge is um, is, is all media, mm-hmm. right? Like the. Uh, you know, computer algorithms and randomly generated text and propaganda posters and um, and and the internet and all that all that kind of stuff that really lends to the feeling of sort of this overwhelming uh, weird place that's bombarding you uh, with signals or messages or what have you. In 1630, there's way less media. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, they've got broadsheets that mm-hmm. they print out and slap up on walls and what have you, and so uh, that stuff's going on, and they're. There is somebody uh, who's creating sort of randomly generated uh, books, sort of like the Tower of Babel in uh, uh, by Borges, but it's um, uh, blocks of words, so that it's it's sort of like William S. Burroughs, the cut-ups mm-hmm. method, or what have you. Mm-hmm. So there is some of some of that. It's it is more weird fantasy, right? right? Um, so there. Uh I hadn't encountered Over the Edge before, and then we came to Gen Con, and we played a game called Interest B, which is a surreal noir, yeah. and I had a great time, and I thought, oh, this is amazing. And I've always liked surrealist stuff, and so I went home and got on the old Google, oh, yeah. and immediately the first one that came up was Over the Edge. Yeah. And so do you have a particular like love of surrealism and like Burroughs and Dolly and all these people, or did you just yeah, think— Yeah, no, I—, I yeah, so— um, Back when I was, uh, for a little while after Lion Rampant, after Mark Reinhagen and I had created Ars Magica, the Mm -hmm. game of wizards in the Middle Ages and what have you, and after uh, we split up the partnership, uh, I wasn't doing anything professionally, and uh, Robin Laws also was not yet in the industry. Right. um, And he suggested, well, what what if someone could do a role-playing game based on William S. Burroughs, who I had never heard of? Okay. (laughs) And so I read that. I love Burroughs. Uh, I like Philip K. Dick, Mm -hmm. uh, all that crazy stuff. And so, um, yeah, that's sort of where Over the Edge came from. And, yeah, I I really like that stuff. I like things that are ambiguous, and I I like things that are kind of hard to interpret. Mm -hmm. And so there are things in the game that are you'll read them and you'll think, well, is this... Is this a bad thing that's going on? Is this a good thing? Like, what is, is this person a villain? Is this person, you know, because it's um, uh, the stuff that's ambiguous pulls you in and makes you sort of uh, do some work confronting it. It also throws you off, right? Mm-hmm. You're not sure what's going on. Uh, and that's um, and that's part of the fun of Over the Edge. So a lot of. Well, not even a lot. There's not a lot of surrealist games out there. That's right. right? So we're, it's a very, you know, only a few things. Right. So do you have, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around that in a way. If yeah. you've never, that's good. Uh, 
it took me playing in a game in that game of Itchers B at Gen yeah. Con uh, a couple years ago to make me realize sort of how to make it work. Yeah. So having done this and designed these, do you have specific things that you go to or tips for people that are actually practical to use to make them to make the games work and have that surrealist feel? So a lot of what I do um, for Over the Edge and also for the project that I'm uh, working on with James uh, is just provide lots of material mm -hmm. and um, and sort of set a tone and and also leave things um, unpolished to some degree. So you know, not a lot of game systems when they do a setting, they are comprehensive, mm -hmm. right? You will learn everything you need to know about this bar and more right. if there's a description of the bar, right? And uh, my approach is more literary, where it's like, I'll tell you everything you need to know about the bar to get you started, to get you excited about what this is and making stuff up yourself. And so uh, for me, it's it's sort of uh, leading by example, just providing lots of material and showing people how to use their own imaginations and, and, and having a setting that is loose enough that, uh, that game masters and players know that they can invent stuff and it's fine. Yeah. And, and uh, well, my my method for introducing surrealism is random tables with inappropriate entries. And uh, a few years ago, I did slugs, and I think there was the uh, oh god, I can't remember the name, like the Brainiac slug or something mm -hmm. like that. That that was so intelligent that it could extrapolate future events, and so it would want to you prevent disaster. So you'd roll on a table. You know, a modern day equivalent is you know you've got to you know. You've got to give the president's, uh, you know, convoy, you've got to make his car get a flat tire in order to make sure a dam doesn't burst mm -hmm. in Brazil. And it's like, what? Right. There's and, some of that in uh, Unknown Armies where it kind of yeah. has that weird yeah. connections of things happening and yeah, whatever. That's the, yeah. So, yeah. 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 So another thing that helps is um, a real world setting. Right, but because because surrealism and the, that that sort of disjointed reality is about being disconnected from the real reality and the real reality has to be there so that you feel that disconnection mm -hmm. so that if you're in a totally fantasy world the the uh weird or surreal elements don't have something mundane to play off of mm -hmm. but in 1630 or in you know over the edge it takes place a couple of years in the future you can bring in all this great stuff and really the first day that i was play testing the 1630 setting um and and I could describe something like uh, the Muslim world and Christendom and what have you. And, and the people at the table understood all sorts of stuff that was going on based on that real historical background. And then the weird stuff that's happening there is in contrast to this normal mm -hmm. world that everybody understands. Well, it does so much of the legwork to where you don't have to explain the world. They already have some kind of broad experience or understanding yeah. mm -hmm. of it, and then you can focus on the surrealism. Right, and they themselves can also create interesting characters mm -hmm. because they you know, they know what the conquistadors were, and they know what the, um, you know, the Thirty Years' War was, or and what have you, yeah. So, do you, I know it's probably, you say it's early in the process, is it, do you guys have any estimation of, a uh, like, next year? There, there's, with, one thing about Lamentations of the Flame Princess, uh, release date estimates yeah. are just, they're nonsense. <laughs> well, It'll, I know as you get further in the project, it gets easier and easier to sort of yeah, have an idea. Yeah. But so, well, I really like James's uh, approach of um, sort of doing the art to fit the layout, uh, which takes longer in calendar time mm -hmm. because you've got to do one thing and then the other. Most companies will be um, commissioning the art while the layout is in process. And then the right. art doesn't match what's on the page, which right, or it has to match. It has to be exactly one half of a page mm -hmm. because you didn't know how big you were really going to need it to be, mm -hmm. and so all the art is exactly one half of a page or, or what have you. And if you if you know how big a piece of art you're going to need, then you can do something that's a different size. Right on. Who is doing the art for the book? No idea yet don't because know. because we don't know when the art would. Stay. Start, you know, when we would need to start getting the art, trying to book someone would just, it, that doesn't make sense because we don't know where they'll be at that time. Yeah, but the, the art style that I've seen from the Lamentations line really fits the over the edge feel, you know, yeah. sort of gritty and weird and, and uh, dark and uh, extra details and, yeah. Awesome would be the word I would use. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> to summarize. <laughs> 
Well, I just want to say that I'm really excited about this project. It is not something that I would have come up with on my own. And in fact, uh, it might have been a week be- between when James contacted me and be- before I finally said, okay, I-, I guess I can do it in 1630 and it'll be... A la Marja. I can see how that'll work. And then I started playing it. It's like, oh, I totally see how this works. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's just I'm more and more excited the more I work on it. Well, the 17th century, I didn't realize how awesome it was till yep. I actually started playing Lamentations because most games you yep. play are either earlier than that or exactly. later than that. And then I started getting into the nitty gritty of things and like the Thirty Years' War, like you mentioned. Yep. And there's like. Humans make the best monsters, I think. Yeah. And there are a lot of terrible people in the 17th century, as it turns out, right? <laughs> right. So uh, um, it's been one of my, um, I guess it's, it's, uh, it's um, refreshed my in, my creative creativity and yeah. stuff to uh, visit a new time period with new yeah. things happening in the world and technologies and that kind of stuff. Well, yeah. I, I like it because, in my opinion, it is the absolute most horrible time to have ever been alive. <laughs> 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 because even... Any other time period, uh, I, I guess the Black Death was awful, but but they had in the 17th century you had the plague, mm-hmm. and, and it and it was probably well. I think the the uh, pestilence that the Europeans brought to the Americas is certainly worse than what the Black Death was in yeah. Europe, mm-hmm. but. It's just awful. Even like World War II and the Holocaust, there was somewhere you could live in the world that was peaceful, that you, you were just reading about that on the news. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like the 17th century, everything is awful everywhere. <laughs> just people just awful to each other. You know, one, one thing when, you know, people, you know, it's totally valid to talk about how the Europeans behaved in Africa, how they behaved in the Americas, but... Look how they were also acting in Europe to other right. Europeans. It was just a complete shit show, top to <laughs> bottom. But it's also for role-playing games, or, or a sh- dare I say D&D-ish role-playing games, no matter what culture you're from, there's still much of the world which is unexplored. Mm-hmm. So there's still the exploration and contact with, with you know strange civilizations. But most people play these games with sort of modern institutions and a modern yeah. mindset. And yeah. the 1600s, 17th century, you know, those institutions, there was capitalism and there were nation states. Yeah, it, joint it, stock corporations. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, so you, can, you can have that, you know, understanding without it being a complete anachronism mm-hmm. like it would be if you were playing, quote unquote, medieval fantasy right. yeah. with, with so much, so many modern assumptions. So it, it's a beautiful place to fit a horror game, you know, because the, the setting it's, the setting itself is so horrible but you still get to do all of the things you do in these adventure games and your understanding of the world actually applies somewhat. Yeah. So, yeah. In some ways, uh, the standard D&D setting is more modern than the 1630s because it's like a pluralistic society where everybody gets along and there are these different religions and they all function side by side and that's great and there's freedom of religion apparently and <laughs> right <laughs> which is a laugh if you look at history yeah right yeah. uh and um like in the 1630s freedom of religion meant freedom of the lord to determine what religion right. everybody in their own terrain <laughs> Right, but he was free to determine it. Right, mm-hmm. yeah. and that's freedom of religion. And God help you, so to speak, <laughs> if you disagree. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, what do you guys besides uh, Over the Edge and Al Armaja and everything coming up? Do you guys have anything else on the on the horizon that you're working on in the distance that you can talk about? Or, uh, I mean, not, yeah, I guess nothing that I can right that, that I'm ready to talk about. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, I got, I, I, I have that referee book I got to finish up, and that's, I, I'm going to have, I'm going to have a draft for people to look at at Spiel, so at least I can say, you know, however longer this takes, it's not my fault anymore. <laughs> <laughs> fair um, enough. Mentioning that, uh, second edition, LOTFP. Okay, that. In, in the, well, let me ask you a question first. In yeah. the back of the Eldritch Cock. Yes, which uh, was the free RPG day book this yes. year from Lamentations. And I want to thank you because I said, can you reach over there and hand me the Eldritch Cock at our game table the other day? And I realized what had just rolled out of my mouth. And was like, well, that's something that is, uh, thank you for that. Well, well, <laughs> at Gen Con, you know, at the convention here, I, 
a whole lot of people. Will you please sign my cock? Or will you please sign your cock? You know? <laughs> right, right. We had a, a good laugh about uh, the inclusion of the apostrophe S. It, it wasn't just Eldridge Cock. It was James Edward Radji IV's Eldridge yeah. Cock. <laughs> well, if you look at the books that I write, you know, everybody is... Every book that someone else writes, their name is on the cover. Right. I always forget to put my name on the cover. <laughs> you know, there's never a bus. So this one is like, okay, my name's right. on the freaking cover. <laughs> so, well, in the back of it, there are the playtest rules for a slightly modified version of LOTFP. And yeah. we've been using them at our table, and we've played about five or six sessions of them. And I really have enjoyed them. Is there an intention or a plan to move forward with them or that's far in the future i mean at the same time i put eldritch cock to press i printed thousands more of the current rule book mm -hmm. so it's a far future thing i you know and the rule book sells more copies every year than the last so it's not coming anytime soon <laughs> but i want to make damn sure when it is time that that stuff's ready, ready that i'm not just starting then on mm -hmm. what might be changes but those are all potential changes because for certain you know there might be ideas i had that people hate yeah and, and yeah. so that wouldn't move forward or you know things that people like but need changing so that's not a concrete plan of what the future of Lamentations will look like. It just seemed like a good way to disseminate the, you know, new ideas. Mm -hmm. And if and all of that is designed that any Lamentations book you pick up, even if you want to use the new rules, you can use all of the current material as written mm -hmm. with it. So that's I saw that uh, was listed in there and it's one thing that I definitely yeah. appreciated because yeah. a lot of games when they make a new edition it's like licensed to just sell more right stuff again yeah. and well there's lots of it sort of like invalidates all the old stuff that you had it still sits on the shelf and now it's a it's a part of the collection as, a th as opposed to something you actually use so yeah well, so my my contribution is uh in the uh over the edge of the alamarja book from 1630 there are going to be new classes oh right. so uh you know classes that sort of fit 1630 better mm -hmm. um a lot of Alamarja is messing around in a city, in this weird, big, weird city, and dealing with all the uh, crazy people or the cults and conspiracies and, and what have you. Uh, and so I wanted some classes that sort of fit that style of play a little <laughs> bit better than a fighter or magic user right. or what have you. Um, and then those would be usable in anybody oh, else's. Yeah. Uh, yeah, campaign. and of course the fun thing about that, like Zach puts cl new classes in his books and everything, and I realize if I, you know, if a second edition, I want to include some of these new <laughs> classes because everybody retains the rights to their old work. You right. know, I'm going to have to pay everybody royalties <laughs> to include the stuff in the next rule book. <laughs> <laughs> Right on. Just change the names. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? Change What's, the name of the class. It's yeah. one of the fun things that you can kind of pick and choose what you like from certain things that fit yeah. your yeah. game and whatever, like for your specific table. So it's nice to have a, a, a broad spectrum of things to choose from because all of them are very thematic from the Amazons to Alice to, you know, yeah. all this stuff. So. And, and then I have, you know, I, I just released over the weekend Sounds of the Mushroom Kingdom. Mm -hmm. In my home campaign, there is a Mushroom Man player character right, right now. Oh, <laughs> wow. So, yeah, even I'm introducing new classes. Fair enough. So, you mentioned you play, you're play, have an LOTFP game at home. Uh, what do you guys play at, at your own tables when you're not, you know, do you have time to play, obviously, when you're not playtesting your own stuff? Is there something that you, that you find that you get your go-to at home? So, mostly when I'm playing i'm playing uh i'm play testing so i'm best friends with rob hainso we're creative partners uh we did 13th age together mm -hmm. so he's play testing something or i'm play testing something so he was in my uh lamentations campaign and uh will be again when we get that started again and um we do try to play some stuff for uh fun um so we're getting ready to do a 13th age uh mm -hmm. campaign the 13th age is sort of like the opposite of Lamentations, <laughs> right? It's very flashy right. and it's uh, very sort of action oriented and it's all about fighting and going up levels and, um, and uh, you know, you're a special person right from the start. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, uh, so one of our players is picking up Eyes of the Stone Thief with his, it's um, about a giant living dungeon that hunts you down, sort of like Moby Dick. Uh, and uh, we, we've heard great things about that. So that's what we're going to get started on. Just, and that's just for fun. 
I try some other fun things. Like I tried Robin Laws' Hill Folk mm -hmm. uh, for fun. We've done Fiasco. But m those are all just sort of like little one-offs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, no, for role playing, it's mainly lamentation stuff, and, and it is weird knowing that every single thing is a potential play yeah. test for a right. publication. But when I'm not doing that, it's usually card games. And here's something that probably in public for you know a podcast isn't the best thing, and I, I felt kind of bad. It felt like oh, you know, I well, I had to go through Atlas and get permission to do you know a. Uh, 1630s over the edge for lamentations but then i thought you know i've been having fun playing all these card games i should do a card game and i'm thinking <laughs> what is the card game that i know of because i'm not a card game designer guy you see you know what would be perfect lamentations gloom because all you're <laughs> because you're just needing because you're yeah. just trying to inflict misery on yeah, all the characters and yeah. it's like that would be perfect but I can't go to them and ask them again <laughs> for something you know? right on. well do you find though that since now you play mostly to play test things or whatever that it's sort of suck the fun and it's out of the gaming and it's now it's a job and everything is a is a sort of working towards a finished product or do you still actually approach gaming with the same amount of, you know, enjoyment that you did before all of this? Well, I, I don't think that playtesting, uh, like, is less fun because it's work. And in fact, for me, I consider game design to be sort of a meta game. Because in game design, you've got, okay, you've got a goal of what you're trying to do, and you've got a schedule to try to beat, and you are going to use these strategies to try to reach those goals, and you're going to try different things and realize they don't work. And so, like, what I've heard about crossword puzzlers is if once they start making their own crosswords, that becomes the puzzle that's fun. And solving someone else's crossword puzzle is just not as engaging as mm -hmm. creating your own crossword. And so... For me, that's what game design has turned into. Right on. That's yeah. And, and the thing about it, when your home game is a potential play test for publication, it usually when, when you play a game, you have the experience and then it's gone. Like if I sit down and I make a village in the game Banished, you know, playing computer games, and then I get it working and it's pretty big, and it's like yeah, and then it, it, that's done. You know, I had whatever enjoyment from putting it together, and then it's done. Mm -hmm. But if I'm, you know, playing Lamentations and stuff turns into a product, and most of it never see, it goes anywhere near publication, but if it turns into a product, it's it's not gone. It, it's now out in the Takes world for other down. people, yeah, to do. Uh, yeah, and you know, and you know, when I was a kid, you know, it was supposed to be the golden age when everything was great in gaming is when you were a kid. I was always afraid I was doing it wrong. <laughs> I, so I, I would. So I would read Dragon Magazine. Well, okay, Dragon, I mostly did it, got it for the Marvel Files. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, like the, the example of play in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And my eight-year-old friends weren't playing like that. Oh, I'm doing something wrong. And so, so there's all, the, all this anxiety and the things that I'm thinking I'm supposed to be doing. I'm a little kid, you know, reading the work of people in, you know, what, the 40s or 50s. And I'm like, why am I not doing it like they're doing it? I'm doing it wrong. I'm horrible. As, you know. But these days, you know, I don't have that anxiety. I mean, I know when I got lazy on preparation, <laughs> and that, but that's on me. Or, But when things go wrong in the game, when the players do something completely crazy and derails everything... That's great. I, I don't have that sort of anxiety that, oh, I'm doing things wrong because I know what I'm freaking doing now. And it's just the, whether the quality of idea, you know, whether that inspires, you know, fun games or whether it turns into something that's, you know, mundane that you've done before. Because right. to me, when the players can get their routine down, it's time to introduce something new because as a game master, it's boring for me watching players go through a routine trying to solve the puzzles as they've already been mm -hmm. presented yeah well thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with us i know it's been a long con and i know we're all exhausted and drained and tired so i really really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us where can people if they want to find you or find your stuff online or wherever where can they go Okay, well, Lamentations of the Flame Princess website is www.lotfp.com. Uh, we've 
also got stuff on Drive Through RPG and RPG Now, of course. We are in the distribution system, so if the stuff is not carried by your local game store, they can order it. Right, and uh, so I'm Jonathan Tweet, and you can find me under that name on uh, Facebook and Google Plus, and Jonathan M. as in Michael Tweet on Twitter. Uh, and then if you like evolution and children's books, uh, you can also look up Grandmother Fish. That's also on uh, on Twitter and Facebook and uh, Google Plus. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm I'm yeah. kind of out of the loop in all of the historical fiction stuff because I hate <laughs> history, but I love science. Uh-huh, okay, <laughs> so me too. That's I, super exciting. Uh, 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 <laughs> I, I've heard that Grandmother Fish is a great way to teach your kids one side of both sides of the argument you're supposed to teach them. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Very good. It's it's an awesome thing, and it's gotten a lot of uh, great reviews. Great press, of, you know, about uh, actually being able to teach children in a in a great and meaningful way. And uh, well, do you want to share the, share the story? But it's a great story of where it came from. Real quick, do you- oh well. So when I, my daughter was little, uh, I wanted her to have a book like this, right? That every kid should have a book that tells them in a really easy way, like where we all came from. And there wasn't anything like it, and so I set out to write it. And it took me 15 years. It's really hard to teach, you know, to make a book that kids like and that is scientifically accurate mm-hmm. and teaches them something valuable about evolution. And so back in 2013, I finally, like, oh, I got it. Like, I was literally in the hot tub, uh, <laughs> you know, and I realized that. Primordial soup. Exactly. <laughs> that the, that the, I was thinking about rituals and how those could have been a part of the formation of language and consciousness in our primeval past. And so rituals are about acting things out or whatever. And it's like, wow, the kids could act out being a fish, you know, wiggle like a grandmother fish and hoot like grandmother ape. And, and getting kids to mimic uh, the actions like that uh, really makes the, uh, the book something kids love to read. Right on. It's awesome. I've heard all about it. Uh, I meant to mention it to Lacey to pick up because we have several uh, children's books about science. I yep. am and always on a hunt because nonfiction is just like put you to sleep boring, yeah. even in the children's books. And like, come yeah. on, guys. Like, oh, I understand there's a limited number of people that are really good at science and also really good at explaining right. and teaching things to children. But like, there's got to be a few of you out there. Yeah, there's not <laughs> much. No, I w- so so to do research for the book, I, I went to the local bookstore to look for the preschool science section. And we're wildly there's, disappointed. There's no preschool yeah. science yeah. section. There's a book. There's no, yeah, not well, there is now. <laughs> right on. Right on. Very cool. Well, anything else you guys have to plug or mention? Oh, well, thanks. Well, that's right about on. it. Well, very much, thank you very much for sitting down and doing this. I really appreciate it. And I suppose we will see you guys next week. Yeah. Thanks for listening. This has been an episode of Just One More Fix. Music has been provided by Kevin McLeod. You can find him at incompetech.com. You can support us at patreon.com slash justonemorefix or follow us on Twitter at justonemorefix. 